If you will get better, everything will get better for you. What a clear message that was for me. He said, if you'll change your philosophy, you'll change your habits, if you'll refine your thinking, if you'll change and accept some new disciplines, if you'll turn the corner where you've been in the past, go for a new life for the future, he said, all kinds of remarkable things will happen for you if you will change. Here's what we must learn to do. I didn't go to work to try to change circumstances. I went to work to try to change myself. And I picked up that promise my teacher shared with me that if I would change, my income would change. If I would change, my bank account would change. If I would change, my future would change. And sure enough, his promise came true for me. You know, the companies were about the same. What they paid was the same. Circumstances around me were the same. You know, my negative relatives were the same. But I was not the same. That's how my life changed. Things started working for me, changing my life all those years ago. We don't have to change what's going on out there. That's the wind that's blowing. All we have to do is change what's going on in here. And now there's several ways to do that. The first subject he called personal development. We must learn from personal experience. Pretty simple. Learn from what happens to you. Take a look back over the last few months. Did you make some mistakes? How could you correct those for the future? Take a look back over the last year. Have you done it right or done it wrong? Let's correct it for the next year. Mr. Schoff asked me when I first met him, he said, Mr. Owen, how are you doing? You've been out there now six years. And I said, I'm not doing very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. What a simple, swift analysis to my situation. He said, if you keep doing it, the next six years will be like the last six. You don't want that to happen. Let's make the changes. So learn from your personal experience. Second, other people's experiences. That's me, other people. That's your teacher. That's your friends and colleagues. The people you meet that can pass along to you their experiences, what's happened to them, the mistakes they made, how they corrected them, how they changed their health and changed their bank account and changed their income and changed their future other people. Now, there's two kinds of people to learn from. One is failures. It's too bad failures don't give seminars, right? That would be valuable. Have them tell you how they lost it all and threw it all away, threw their health away and threw their friendships away and things didn't work out well. That would be valuable. But now then we must also learn from positive people that have done well. They've got the health. And so we ask them, how did you become so healthy? They've got the skills. So we ask them, how did you become this skillful? They've got the income, so we ask them, how did you get here in such a short period of time? So now here's what's important in personal development. In learning from other people, we learn, number one, by observation. We learn what we see. We watch people that are successful in what they do. In sports, we watch their disciplines. In business, we watch their disciplines. Second, we learn by what we hear. Learn by listening. And then listen to the sermon on Sunday morning. Listen to the lectures. Listen to the teacher. Listen to someone who's got something good to say. And then number three is vitally important on personal development. And that is read all the books, all the books you can possibly read in your lifetime. Mr. Schoff got me started on my library. I've got one of the better libraries. And then I started keeping a journal. One of the major things my teacher taught me was to keep a journal. He said, don't trust your memory. If you hear something good, just make a little note and write it down. So I would suggest you do the same. Things that impress you, a poem that impresses you. Uh, when you attend a class, some of the ideas that impressed you, jot them down. You read something in a magazine, write some ideas. Take those out, put them in your journal. Keep a good journal the rest of your life. This will serve you well. So I want the same thing to happen to you. Value captured that you can resort to later. Go back over it and review it and let it become valuable to you. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Develop the skills, learn the lessons, take the classes, uh, absorb all that is being taught to you these days. And then later on, of course, you can sort it out, what's valuable to you and how to refine it for your business and for your life and for your future. But the main thing is to get it and start this process of personal change. Now let's cover the second step, setting goals. We need to take a look into the future. There are four things.
to consider in terms of attitude. One is how you feel about the past. Best advice I can give you on that is treat the past as a school. Let it teach you the mistakes you've made, the things that went wrong, the things that didn't work. Don't use the past as a burden to carry and don't use the past as a club to beat yourself to death. Past losses, past failures, past mistakes. But let the past be a school. Tough school, maybe. We've all been through some tough stuff. So if you feel good about the past, draw from it for experience and let it teach you. Then next is how you feel about the future. We've got to have the future well designed. The future is called the promise. The promise of the future can be an awesome force. Designing the future, there's two ways to face the future. One is with apprehension and the other is with anticipation. I promise you in my travels around the world, most people face the future with apprehension. And here's why, they don't have it well designed. They've sort of left that up to someone else to fix. But here's the best way to face the future with anticipation. You can face the future with anticipation if the future is clear, if the future is well designed. In setting goals, it's very simple. Number one, decide what you want. You just take a little time. You sit down and say, what do I want? What kind of skills do I want? What kind of income do I want for the future? Where would I like to go? Places I'd like to visit? Habits I'd like to acquire? Skills I'd like to have? Economics? Friendships? People you'd like to meet? When you've thought about what you want for the future, make a list. If the future gets clear, the price gets easier. Because you've got to remember, for every promise, there's a price to pay. Everybody's got to pay the price. Everybody's got to do the deal. Everybody's got to do the disciplines. But here's what I've discovered. If the promise is clear and powerful, the price is easy to pay. The price is some classes. The price is a few books. The price is a few disciplines. The price is finding something that'll make your life better, make you grow, make you change, make you develop. So the first part of the key is to design the promise. Then what is the price to pay? I'm telling you, the price will be easy. If you'll make the promise of the future clear for yourself, all of the values of life that you could possibly want, and be serious about it, I promise you it's an easy price to pay. Anybody can pay it. And the best advice I can give you is if I can do it, you can do it. Start setting your goals and see if you can't get a better excitement going for the things you want to accomplish for the future. One of the major reasons for setting goals is for what they make of you in achieving them. My teacher advised me when I first got started at age 25, he said, Jim, why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? I'm here to help you. And he said, here's why, for what it will make of you to achieve it. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve them. So part of the key here is to set the kind of goals that will make something of you. Don't set them too low so that you don't have to grow and you don't have to read and you don't have to try and you don't have to stretch. Don't set them too low. And then don't sell out. Don't go for something that's going to cost you your virtue or cost you your values or sell out your principles. There's a good middle road here to follow. Goals that will inspire, goals that will help you grow, change, develop, and become better than you are. So if you want something to pull you through all kinds of challenges, all kinds of difficulties, and things that come at you, you gotta have something on out there, beyond today, beyond next week, beyond next month, beyond this year, that pulls you into the future. And the clearer it is, the stronger it pulls. The more dynamic it is, the more it affects your life, your spirit, your heart, your soul, it also creates imagination. It gets your mind working on how to achieve that purpose. And if your mind will work, and if your heart works, and if your spirit works, and if you have good input, like good ideas, I'm telling you, there isn't anything you can't accomplish. Ideas gather dust, you know, they don't produce at all by themselves. It's like philosophy is not the end. Philosophy is the beginning. Philosophy must be invested. When I talked about philosophy, attitude, and disciplines, they must be invested. And if you invest philosophy and attitude in disciplines, then they produce results. Here's a good phrase. Wisdom uninvested in labor is wasted. 
attitude, even the highest of attitude, which is faith. Faith uninvested is wasted, produces nothing. So the name of the game is not faith. The name of the game is not philosophy. The name of the game is to put faith and philosophy into activity so that it starts making progress. Turning nothing into something. Let me give you that formula while I'm on it here. Turning nothing into something. How do you do that? How do you turn nothing into something? Here's how you start. There's three steps to it. Number one, imagination. And try to imagine yourself in those new, worthwhile, unique positions. So imagination starts to change everything. Now, imagination is not tangible, but it is almost real. Almost real. It's not real, but it's almost real. But it's hard to say that imagination is nothing. But it's nothing in terms of tangible. It's not, it's not tangible yet. And you always have to say yet. Imagination is not tangible yet. But it is the beginning of turning nothing into something. It's the beginning of turning nothing into reality. Imagination. Imagination is the ability to see things that don't yet exist. Imagination is real in the sense that it affects It'll affect your behavior, it'll affect your enthusiasm, it'll affect your emotions. It's real in that sense, but it's not real in the tangible sense. Next is faith. To believe that what you imagine is possible. How would we start to strengthen our belief in that what we imagine is possible to turn it into reality? And there's two or three ways. One is to believe your own testimony. If you've done it before, why couldn't you do it again? If you've done it once, couldn't you do it the second time? Why not believe in your own testimonial? If I did it before, I can do it again. And that's what's important about personal development. You can lose the money, but not the skill. So who cares about the money? It's like sales. A skill is more valuable than a sale. Someone, sometimes a salesperson says, I need a sale. I said, no, you need a skill. Sales are temporary. Skills are permanent. Now we move to faith to believe that what we imagine is possible. So we study our own testimony. If we've done it before, we can do it again. Here's what else we study. Other testimonials of somebody who did it. Somebody that built a hotel said, yes, I started with some plans and finally believed it was possible, and here it is. Say, well, if it's possible for one, it's possible for another. In fact, sometimes when we hear the testimonial, here's how they finished. If I can do it, you can do it. See, that that's a classic testimonial that gives us now what we call faith. And one of the ancient wise writers said, faith is generated by what we hear, the vocabulary of what we hear, the vocabulary of what we read. That generates faith to believe that it's possible. Now, faith is not reality. You can't say faith is nothing because it affects it's like radiation. To us, it's nothing because it can't be seen. Right? You can't see it, but it has an incredible effect. And that's true of faith. Faith can't be seen right? with the natural eye. It can't be seen, but it has an incredible effect on your attitude, on your behavior, on your disciplines, on your work for the day, and all the rest. Here's what one writer described faith. Faith is a substance. A substance of hope. Now, it's, it's, it's not a substance like a brick being a piece of the hotel, but it's almost. It's so close, it's substance. And it, the writer also said it's so close, it's evidence. Now, not evidence you can see, but tangible evidence that's just as real as all of our human experiences that can't be touched, can't be seen. It's called the unseen magic. Language is the unseen magic. It can't be seen. The words can't be seen as they're transmitted from the speaker to the one who listens. But it can have a profound effect. That means it's more than nothing. Language is more than nothing. But to create something out of nothing, we start with imagination. Then we move to faith, which believes it's possible, which is almost real. 
But now here's what we do with faith and imagination. We deposit it in disciplines and activity. Because faith without the activity serves no useful purpose. Imagination without the activity to translate it into reality serves no purpose. But wisdom and faith deposited in activity creates reality. The reality of a career, the reality of a hotel that wasn't there. Now here's all you got to do to turn that around. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. A few simple disciplines practiced every day starts to create success. Not at the end of the first day. The first day is the end of a new beginning. 